You ever had this problem? You're looking to play a classic RE game, but you literally just got done playing all the classic RE games. You want something familiar, but something different too. Well, in these trying times, the only thing you can really count on is the ingenuity and hyper-focused efforts of Survival Horror Mega fans. AKA, we are rounding up and checking out a whole bunch of RE mods today. Now, typically, I only mess with the less alteration and more restoration-oriented mods like the Seamless HD Project or Classic Rebirth, but today I'm breaking with that habit and we are taking a look at nearly every single RE mod available with only a few exceptions. Simple outfit changes or play as X character mods don't really interest me very much and outside of that, they don't really require much explanation on my end, so you're not going to see many of those, but I can assure you we aren't hurting for entries in this list without them. So strap in because you are about to get a face full of Resident Evil modifications. From PC to real hardware, we're jumping headfirst down one hell of a deep rabbit hole. Ladies, gentlemen, I'm Jared from Avalanche Reviews. Welcome to the Resident Evil retrospective. And brightly starting this list off, we've got a series of mods that try their damnedest not to modify much at all. Classic Rebirth is an amazing restoration project, the goal being to get the previously released Japan-only PC ports of Ares 1, 2, and 3 working on modern computers. And really, that's about it. Instead of altering the games or repackaging them, Classic Rebirth just allows them to run and look exactly how they would have if 16-core CPUs, standardized USB controllers, and 4K display resolutions were available when they were developed. If you're looking for the absolute most accurate Resident Evil experience on PC, this is your one and only stop. But it's not just the accuracy that earns this project top billing on this video. Classic Rebirth is so instrumental in the entire existence of modern RE modding that just about every single mod we'll be looking at moving forward is going to require it to work. It really can't be understated how awesome it is to see someone so interested in allowing people access to these amazing PC ports but holding back in terms of trying to quote unquote improve the experience. All the work done here was to just let the port's limitations get out of your way so you could play them exactly how they existed when they were released. It's definitely a mindset that should be celebrated, but that's enough doting. Let's jump into what you can expect from each instance of this mod. Here's my radio. You should keep it. I'm... Resident Evil 1 was released for Windows 95 equipped PCs first in Japan by NEC in 1996, but a year later we Americans would see a port handled directly by Capcom and really neither matter as far as classic rebirth goes. And that's because it uses a Japan only version of the game released two years later meant to take better advantage of Windows 98. We like to call this the Media Kite release after the team that ported it, but you can also find it under the title Ultra 2000. Just like every classic Rebirth release, the process of modding this game could not be easier. The most complex part is going to be sourcing your own disc image or real disc of the game, but I imagine the internet archive can help you out with the first part of that. Once you've got the image, just mount it, drag over its contents to a folder on your PC, and drop the classic rebirth.dll file into the root of that folder, and that is literally it. You're already set to go. Depending on what print of the MediaKite release you got, you may need to grab an updated version of the EXE, but that can be found on the same site that you got the CRDLL from, so this really couldn't be a more user-friendly affair. After you've done that, you can open the game now and find that Classic Rebirth includes a nifty little launcher which will let you change display options, map your buttons, and tweak some new additions that adds a little future RE functionality to the older games. You know, stuff like quick turning or reloading outside of the inventory using R1 and cancel. Oh, and I probably should have mentioned this before, but CR also translates the Japanese text in the game, so no worries there, although there is a toggle to disable that. Keeping with the whole accuracy thing, Classic Rebirth only utilizes 4x3 resolutions, and even though they stop just before 4K, setting it to full screen and then letting your GPU scale it the rest of the way to your desktop resolution still results in an amazing picture. 
There are other graphics options, but honestly, not even 1% of the people who'd want to play this game are going to need to change any of these. They're basically just for insane people like myself. Speaking of which, there is a bilinear texture filtering option, and I would personally recommend you leave that off. The overly smooth effect this has on the game's 3D models is kind of nasty looking in my opinion. On the plus side, you can toggle this in-game using F7, so feel free to try it out and see what you think on the fly. And really that's it. After you choose a resolution and rebind your controls, you're in. But there are some of you who might want to roll up your sleeves and do just a little more work before starting this game up proper. The MediaKite version of RE1 included some notoriously nasty FMVs. Not only were they pretty low res even for the time, but for some reason I truly can't understand, they were encoded at 10 entire frames per second, and you can really tell. My best guess for this probably has something to do with the fact that they were just packed onto the disc as AVI files instead of being compressed and decompressed on the fly like they are in the PS1 or most PC games. I mean, this is a single 700 megabyte CD we're talking about. Either way though, there is a fix. The RE1 Classic Rebirth High Quality Video Pack is quite literally exactly what its name says it is. Just download the pack, drag its contents to the root of your RE1 install, and start the game up. These new video files double the vertical resolution of the originals to a mind-altering 640x480 and run at a frame rate that luckily won't cause rapid eyeball bleeding. They are a bit darker than the originals, which is a downside, but at the very least, I don't have to watch and be aware of each solitary frame being drawn to the screen in real time. But alright, you've got all the prep work done, so once you've got those plopped down, you are ready to play yourself some RE1 on PC, and it is amazing. You saved me! Yeah. Of course, these are still the exact same backgrounds and 2D assets from the PS1 original, so do set your expectations accordingly, but I would say this looks incredible. This being the PC port of RE1, we do get to skip door animations, and that's great. Maybe not for the person playing the game for the first time, but if you're on your thousandth playthrough, it's pretty damn well appreciated. Like I said before, there are toggles for gameplay features found in later RE titles like being able to quick turn and reloading with the cancel button. Two very small additions that go a long way in updating RE1's gameplay and general feel. But if you feel like that gets in the way of how the game was meant to be played, you can always toggle them off. Other than that though, this is just flat out RE1. I won't go into the myriad of differences between this port and the PS1 original, but I have made a video on that exact subject if you're interested. In fact, I've made one for each game Classic Rebirth supports, so check those out if you're looking for more specific info. But we have a lot to cover, so what do you say we move on to the next one? And this one should be pretty easy because it's basically the same story as RE1. Just head to the Classic Rebirth website, grab the .dll, and throw it into the root of a folder containing all the crap that came on the install disk. I'm happy to say this mod does not use the god-awful 1999 Platinum PC port, but instead the well-loved Source Next release. This Japan-only Windows 98 version of the game is sort of famous in the scene for containing uncompressed 60 frame per second FMVs, and if you haven't seen these things in action, it really is amazing. I mean, the difference between this... <laughs> ...and this... Is almost too vast to describe with words. I've got to imagine there's some kind of interpolation going on with the Source Next FMVs because I really can't see the dev team at Capcom rendering out the originals at 60 FPS and then dropping a majority of those frames just to put them on a disc, but to be fair, I really have no idea, so that very well may be the case. Regardless of why, though, let's just all be glad we have these amazing looking CG cutscenes to watch. There is a 1080p upscaled FMV pack that you could technically couple with this install if you wanted to, but with how amazing these things look as is, it really isn't worth the effort in my eyes. Getting back to the actual mod we're here to cover and not its FMVs though, we have a similar launcher giving you similar options to mess with as RE1. Once again, I would suggest using full screen as your resolution and that texture filtering be disabled. There's a new option letting you correct for texture warping, but since most things in the game aren't textured 3D objects, I'd wager you wouldn't really see the difference this toggle makes until you fight the alligator or maybe Birkin's blob form. We've also got a few functionality options here, and just like before, I can't really see a reason why you'd want to disable them. 
configuring your controller of choice is just as easy as it was in RE1, and just like that, we are playing its sequel RE2. Really, just about the only note I can think of has to do with the Sourcenext port's Japan-only nature. If you didn't know, RE2 was altered a bit before it crossed the pond. More enemies were placed in different places, and to compensate for that, they added a bunch of hidden pickups like green herbs and handgun ammo. And since the Source Next port was based on the Japanese original release of RE2 on the PS1, you're not going to find any of that stuff here. Which means the muscle memory I built up from playing this game hundreds of times in the past is going to waste a little bit. Once again, you can skip door animations, but it's not as smooth of an operation as it was on RE1. Over there, skipping transitions would have you instantaneously loading into the new area, but here in RE2, there's a bit of a wait before that process takes place. Honestly, it's not too long, and it's still way shorter than the door animations themselves, but it was enough of a difference that I felt justified in wasting both of our time mentioning it. Other than that, this is just a bog-standard game of RE2, which is to say it is just one of the best video games ever made, and you're getting to play it exactly how you would back in the late 90s, only at a level of fidelity no one would have ever imagined back then. Not a bad way to spend an afternoon. He's after stars, members. There's no escape! Installing Classic Rebirth for RE3 is the exact same process as it was before. It uses the equally high quality Source Next release of the game as a base, which is killer because once again this port is world renowned for including uncompressed 60fps FMVs, along with backgrounds rendered out at double the internal resolution found in RE2s, and in both cases that's going to be a huge thumbs up for me. Once again, we have an adorable little launcher that lets us configure things. A cool new addition is an option for favorable RNG and one that automatically skips all door transitions. Two settings that seem tailor-made for speedrunners and guys like me who are looking to record footage. As far as graphics go, full resolution is again going to be needed for 4K, but there's one really interesting toggle and in true Avalanche Reviews fashion, it's going to require a bit of a tangent to explain. I think everyone knows that RE3 had great looking backgrounds in its initial PS1 outing, but I assume less will know that the backgrounds included in literally every other port had significantly higher render resolutions. The GameCube, Dreamcast, and PC releases all saw pre-renders that were natively 640x480, and I mean just look at how gorgeous they were. We're not using AI upscalers here, at least not yet. This is just how amazing these images looked right out of the box. But if you're looking really hard, you might notice small areas where it seems like the whole high res thing doesn't really apply. Here on the brick wall heading up from the bottom, things look detailed and expectedly high res, but once we get to this line, it's like the graphics go back to being rendered internally at 240p. And interestingly, that's because they are. It'll take forever to fully explain, but on the most basic level, old RE required a little more work than just importing 2D images. Mask textures were needed for things that were in front of the character and to make up for certain quirks with how these images were loaded in and out of the PS1's memory, and those mask textures are what makes these games such a pain in the ass to upscale. Because they're processed differently from the background images themselves, you can often see borders where they don't quite line up, so most devs porting RE games back in the day would just choose to leave these mask textures alone, which is why some parts of the image in RE3 look 240p and others 480p. That was a little awful, but now you have the prerequisite knowledge necessary for me to explain what this option does. It essentially just downscales the backgrounds to 240p so they align better with the mask textures, but even after all that explaining, I wouldn't really recommend using this. There's still going to be noticeable boundaries where mask textures overlap with the backgrounds, they're just both really low res now. And it also downscales 3D elements to 240p, so it's sort of a lose-lose. Personally, I stopped seeing these mask textures after a while anyways, and even if I didn't, it's not really worth missing out on how good these backgrounds look natively. Just like with RE2, you can download some upscaled FMVs, but once again, it's not really worth going through the trouble. The stock ones already look amazing, and the overly smoothed out look of AI upscaling actually kind of makes them look worse in my opinion. Where gameplay is concerned, once again, this is just the RE3 that you know and love. As far as I'm aware, there's no significant differences between the US and Japanese releases of 3, so that's nice. And that favorable RNG option is great for those not wanting to restart every time they get to the RPD and the game decides to spawn the Magnum instead of the grenade launcher. I was able to find a pretty weird glitch that had the water dripping in the alleyway outside the starting area at like 5 times speed. 
I'm not really sure what's causing that, but it's the only real issue I was able to find up until the train crash. And in the grand scheme of things, it's not exactly the kind of problem that's likely to bother anyone. These classic Rebirth mods are some of the best things to happen to RE games since Shinji Mikami. They give people access to Resident Evil titles in their highest fidelity, but in a way that ensures the experience is going to be accurate to the original. It's really not often you see someone do so much work to make sure it didn't look like they did much work at all. These are amazing restorations and I can't recommend them enough. The most difficult part of playing them is going to be sourcing your own disc images for 90s PC games, but something tells me this audience is going to be able to figure that out. And hey, that's three mods down with about 13 to go, so what do you say we move on to another series of modifications targeting Ares 1, 2, and 3, only this time with a little less of a focus on restoration and a whole lot more on renovation. As much as I prefer the original, pixelated look of old 16 and 32 bit games, even I can recognize that's not exactly a mainstream position. Some people want to see these games more as they remember them after years of rose tinted glasses and while that's not exactly my thing, I can totally respect it. I mean hey, we all want to see what we want to see, and the good news is the seamless HD project has made it possible to play the first three mainline PS1 RE entries in genuine high definition. Taking advantage of an AI, the team behind this project have done way more than just feeding each 2D background into an upscaler and calling it a day. Remember how I was talking about RE's mask textures before? Well, it was this mod that made me aware of all that. Instead of individually upscaling each mask texture and dealing with the nightmare of getting rid of the resulting seams, they just made new ones from their already upscaled backgrounds and the result is pretty amazing. Despite my very obvious, very vocal bias towards lower res graphics, it is really hard to deny the kind of effort that turned this into this. I mean, it's a real world of difference. Of course, you do have to have realistic expectations. 2D image upscaling is a fascinating industry, but it is still in its infancy. Honestly though, even if it wasn't, these are very, very low res images they're attempting to upscale. Ones with lots of small details that need to be restored, and as it is, small details can be mangled by even the most advanced AI upscaler. So if you're looking close, you may notice distortion on stuff like written words or thin straight lines that are all close together, which can be noticeable, but certainly it's not something you'll be aware of 99% of the time you're playing. And you know, I think that's a good enough introduction for now, so let's get down in the dirt with the first RE game and the most recent addition to the Seamless HD roster. The whole Resident Evil SHD thing kicked off with the second and third entries in the series for reasons we'll cover when we get to them, but it wasn't until recently that we could see a version of the mod dedicated to RE1. The install process for this one is technically just a little more complicated than the mods we've talked about so far, but it might be the easiest thanks to a video explaining each step that you can find on the Seamless HD website. And during that install process, you're going to find out something very, very interesting about this mod outside of the whole HD backgrounds thing. First off, it uses the MediaKite release of RE1 on the PC as its base, which is kind of expected. The classic Rebirth DLL is also necessary, but we haven't gotten to the interesting part yet. See, before installing this HD mod, you're going to have to install a different HD mod made by Team X. Once you have that, you then replace the Team X files in your install directory with the ones in the SHD download and you're basically good to go. Before you actually start it up though, it is important to say that this is going to override the files from the original install, so if you just wanted to play Classic Rebirth, you'd still be getting the HD backgrounds. Oh, and by default, this pack is going to use the alternate backgrounds that can be found in the Director's Cut release of RE1. If you're not down with that, there is a way you can enable the originals, but if you're like me, this is kind of a bonus. The Seamless HD website recommends not going over a 960p display resolution, I assume maybe because the backgrounds were only made to be scaled to an even integer, but I forced them to 4K and played up until where the hunters showed up and really only noticed this one issue in the walkway above the dining room. Once you start the game up, some of the improvements are going to be obvious before you even get into any gameplay. <laughs> 
Since RE1 on PC shipped with those gross looking choppy FMVs, it was really nice seeing them get the upscale treatment, and they've also been interpolated to 60 FPS, something I thought I would hate but I kind of ended up falling in love with. Normally I would not enjoy the smeary look of interpolated frames, but I've seen these FMVs more than a million times. Witnessing them move this fluidly really transforms the experience. Getting into the actual game though, I'm not gonna lie to you, this is not the best advertisement for the Seamless HD project. All over the place there are distorted lines, messed up details, and little issues that are gonna be noticeably off. And I think I might know why. Number one, these are incredibly low res images like we've talked about before, but number two, they were so simplistic in terms of geometry that they relied on a lot of straight lines. Two things that can spell trouble for software upscalers. Unlike the other two HD mods in this series, you're probably going to notice at least one major flaw on just about every screen you're on, but that doesn't mean this is a bad mod. Alongside some of those flaws are really good looking aspects of the picture that upscaled really well. It also looks like some of the background images have had new textures placed over top of them for a better overall look. Mostly stuff like wood grain, wallpaper designs, and carpet fibers. Even though this is what I would call the weakest showing in the Seamless HD library, I would still very much recommend it. There's just something about these upscales that really increases the atmosphere, and oddly enough, I got a much better sense of scale from the straighter, less pixelated lines in the upscales. It's really interesting how rooms just felt bigger and far off shots seemed deeper even though they weren't fundamentally different from the one seen in the PS1 original. The 2D textures placed over 3D characters have also been either upscaled or totally redrawn and I have to admit, at least in this one area, I 100% prefer the originals. I mean, it's not necessarily a bad look, and it is very cool seeing Jill's pants now have realistic pants-like textures, but I don't know, the original unfiltered pixels just appeal to me so much more. Even though I prefer the look of the originals on PC, I still enjoy the hell out of the Seamless HD project. Since the RE1 specific mod was released, I've beaten the game twice using it, and it was great both times. Just like you guys, I have played a lot of RE1 in my day, and sometimes all it takes is a few different camera angles or a slight change in the presentation to justify adding another notch to that belt. So even if you're like me and prefer the original look of Resident Evil, take my advice and try out the Seamless HD mod regardless. You would genuinely be surprised how the slightest change can make a familiar game feel fresh and new again. Just look at her. She was a true beauty. When I first caught wind of this project, RE's 2 and 3 were the only releases they had under their belt, and the way these new HD backgrounds were being injected into the game sort of became even more interesting to me than the fact that they existed. See, instead of being some kind of an alteration made to the source next port of RE2, these backgrounds were actually being applied to a GameCube ISO using a custom configured build of Dolphin. According to the team behind the project, Dolphin has a specific feature that allows them to replace assets in the game on the fly without having to write those assets to the original game disc. Now I probably should mention that recently the team has made a fork of the mod that can be applied to the Source Next release of 2 and 3, but for today's video I went with the original GameCube method because, like I said, it's way more interesting. Getting this thing up and running is dead simple. You just head to the RE2 portion of the SHD site and snag the download. This will contain a pre-configured arm of the Dolphin emulator set up specifically to run this game. You will of course have to bring your own GameCube ISO of RE2, but that's a lot easier to get your hands on than a Source Next one, trust me. Right off the bat, you're probably going to notice how awful the FMVs look, something that 100% can be blamed on this being the GameCube port. If you haven't seen my video on RE2 ports, out of all the possible ways you could play this game, this version has the worst looking FMVs by far. But don't worry, once again there is a high quality FMV pack that you can download and it definitely does help. Moving on to the actual game, immediately you're going to be able to tell that the upscale worked far better here than in the previous game. Maybe it's due to the higher res nature of the image files or their more detailed design, but this is a much better picture than RE1 by a long shot. Removing a lot of the pixelation from the images does sort of have everything looking like the kind of CG you'd find in a 90s show like Reboot, but I'm not sure this team could have done much to help that. One really cool thing is that the Seamless HD release lets you swap between the original and upscaled backgrounds on the fly, which is really, really cool. The few times I streamed this, I found myself switching between the two a lot, just sort of reminding everybody how things used to look. Alright, so overall, this is a massive improvement over RE1, at least as far as the backgrounds are concerned. 
The textures on 3D models have also been upscaled, but the results aren't as nice looking to me. It sort of looks hand-drawn or maybe even cel-shaded, which really clashes with the 3D models and the environment. Maybe this is just me, but I would love an option to just upscale the backgrounds and nothing else, but for all I know that probably exists in the PC version and I sound like an idiot right now. It looks to me like some of the smaller 2D details that couldn't be upscaled very well were replaced with new images and I'm fine with that. It gives you something new to look at if you've seen these areas so many times you could essentially draw them from memory. If you choose to go with the GameCube version of Seamless HD, you are going to get some of the inherent flaws of that port, like the weird pink, purple tones and black parts of the screen. Also, you can't skip door animations here, which is not the worst problem to have, but once you're used to it, it is kind of hard going back. Once again, I know I'm going to sound crazy and no one's going to be surprised here, but I do still prefer the original pixelated look of the OG backgrounds when scaled up to higher resolutions. That being said, I think this whole AI image upscaling thing is just the coolest and it's pretty insane to think that we can do something like this to old video games. And keep in mind, these are still very early days for the technology. Imagine how the Seamless HD mod's gonna look in 2045. RE3 is, in my opinion, the most impressive out of the Seamless HD releases, and that's for a bunch of reasons, but before we talk about that, we should get into something I didn't cover in the last one. I chose the dolphin arm in this mod not only because replacing a GameCube game's textures on the fly via an emulator is awesome, but because installing the PC version was very, very complicated. The team uses the Source Next ports of 2 and 3 and the classic Rebirth mods, but there were a lot of steps to the process and I just couldn't get either to work. So we are once again using the Dolphin emulator, which has its benefits and drawbacks. One of the latter being that the SHD team found replacing item art in the inventory for RE3 to be nearly impossible thanks to the way that Dolphin is set up to swap textures. Of course, you guys know I have no issues with nicely scaled pixel art, but maybe that's a deal breaker for someone listening. Of course, you do have the crappy FMVs from the GameCube disc, but like you would imagine, there is a fix for that. Swapping out some AI upscaled versions of the 60fps FMVs from the Source Next release is dead simple, which is good because I highly recommend you do that. As far as getting this thing up and running, it's exactly as dead easy as the last game. Just snag the download from the SHD website, point the emulator to your ISO of RE3, and you're cruising. Like I said at the start, this specific release is by far the best showing for what this kind of mod is capable of. I'm sure it helped that RE3's backgrounds were rendered out at twice the internal resolution as RE2's, but regardless of why, the results here are just mind-boggling. Even details like the blurry reflections from glossy car hoods show up really well in this upscale. Looking at how amazing and lifelike these backgrounds look, it makes you yearn for the reality where PS1 games commonly used 480p 2D assets. I mean, look at these things. They're almost photorealistic in a lot of cases. The distorted and crooked lines from Mari's 1 and 2 aren't here in any significant sense, which goes a long way in letting your brain forget it's seeing old 90s era CG pre-renders. Look, the upscale job here is just flat out approaching flawlessness. I really can't say if it's due to the increased resolution in 3's assets, a little more attention being applied to this specific game, or some combination of the two. But if you're looking to play an RE game with upscaled backgrounds and you want it to look good enough to sell you on the future of this whole AI-assisted image restoration thing, play RE3. Don't come any closer. Once again, I do still prefer the original look of these old games upscaled to HD without the assistance of AI, but you really can't beat the novelty here. I've completed each release of the Seamless HD line of mods multiple times and it's because they offer just a slight twist on an experience I already loved. All three of these come highly recommended by me, and you really can't lose with any of them, but if you are looking for the most wow-worthy contender, I'd say three wins that hands down. Alright, 
right, so now we're cooking with the real shit. Not only is it an unspeakably amazing idea to take Resident Evil Survivor, one of the more underrated spin-offs in the series, and turn it from a first-person shooter into a traditional RE game, but to make that concoction playable on a real PS1, I... I'm sorry, I, I can't finish this sentence, I, I need to change my pants. Now in fairness, there is a more current and half-finished build of this project available for PC, but... I mean, come on, you guys knew damn well I wasn't going to pass up this chance to play a proper RE mod on real PS1 hardware. This version only allows you to play up to the movie theater, which is in my opinion more than far enough for me to convince you what an awesome idea this is. Created by Aiden Watkins, a name you're going to be hearing a lot in the world of RE modding, Survivor Redux takes the first spin-off Resident Evil game and ports it into RE2. The backgrounds were made by playing the PS1 FPS and essentially taking screenshots to use as pre-rendered environments, making for one hell of an interesting project. I've always said Survivor's atmosphere and setting is way better than a lot of hyperbolic people on the internet give it credit, and adding fuel to that fire is the prospect of playing through its events using that tried and true traditional Resident Evil style gameplay, which is about as awesome as it sounds. The game runs by basically replacing assets from RE2 with ones from Survivor, so it's going to feel perfect control-wise, but having a limited inventory, save points, and a limited handgun ammo supply is going to be jarring if you're used to the original. I will say, however, it does certainly bump up the difficulty, but to be honest, it's not on the unfair side of things. It seems like enemy placement is the same as the original, and some of the selected camera angles can make running into them without knowing it sort of easy, but I learned to be more mindful of new areas, and it was no longer an issue. At least in this console version of the mod, in-engine cutscenes don't work yet, but I talked to Aiden about this on Twitter a very long time ago, and he said he was planning to record all of the in-engine cutscenes from the original game using the original first-person perspective, and then he wants to compress them down into FMVs that can play out in the actual mod. I'm not really sure if that's still the case, but I hope so because that sounds amazing. Really, the further you look into this project, the more cool it becomes. If you're a geek about this kind of stuff, you really couldn't find a more interesting mod to play around with. I haven't checked out the latest build of the PC version yet, but it's supposed to be playable up to the 50% point of the game, and I imagine it's in an even better state than what I'm playing here. That being said, if you're into playing game mods on real hardware, you absolutely cannot miss out on this opportunity. Just grab this image right now, put it in your PS1 however you can, and get transported to an arguably better alternate history. Okay, so you guys remember how I said I wasn't going to cover many of the character swap mods? Well, I'll give you one and that's it. Created by Aiden Watkins, Barry's mod is basically what it sounds like. You get to play through the events of RE1 as everybody's favorite ginger, Barry Burton. Now, this is obviously just a model-swapped Chris campaign, but there's a little more going on here. This thing offers up some rearranged gameplay with zombies and items swapped to different areas and locked doors needing different keys than they used to. Now, freely admit, I don't exactly play these arranged mods very often. See, part of what I like about these games is how familiar I am with them. Where to get what, when certain events trigger, it's kind of soothing just sitting down with a game you already know like the back of your hand. That being the case, I never thought I'd enjoy this kind of mod, but I actually had fun with it. It forced me to think differently about the game, and that was admittedly less stressful than I thought it would be. Counterintuitively, the whole playing as Barry thing ends up being the least interesting part of this mod. As I played this thing, I wasn't thinking, oh nice, I get to see what Barry was up to, but instead I was more interested in the rearranged gameplay. I started forming a little mental checklist of rooms I could potentially get key items from. Honestly, it was sort of nice being somewhat at a loss as to where to go, but also familiar enough to know the general direction you probably should be going in. I also noticed there have been some tweaks to foundational stuff, like I wasn't able to run from the yawn fight, so prepare for this thing to challenge that RE1 photographic memory you've built up over the years. I'd say reach for this one if you want an awesome new take on a game you're already well familiar with and maybe not when you really want a well thought out look at Barry's role in the events of RE1. Uh. 
Resident Evil Revisited is a full conversion mod that runs inside of RE2 SourceNext PC port. It tells the story of an Umbrella agent trying to sneak into the lab underneath the Spencer Mansion in order to retrieve research data backups that were supposed to have been transferred off-site when the T-Virus outbreak began. You play as Trent, a guy who's supposed to be a big shot in the RE novels, but I don't really read those, so for all I know that could be wrong. Either way, Trent's been ordered to access the Spencer lab via a tunnel entrance built into a small town motel. On the way there, a zombie runs out in front of his car, causing him to crash it literally into the place he's trying to get to. After exploring the town, you start to uncover a bit of a secret operation with the umbrella-employed head of the motel kidnapping stuck travelers and experimenting on them. The currently available version of the mod ends just before gaining access to the lab, but so far I like what I'm seeing. It plays exactly how you'd want a fan-made RE game too. Lots of backtracking, item collecting, and puzzle solving, and it's all pretty competently made. I'll admit, there were a few times where I couldn't figure out what the game wanted me to do next, but for the most part, this was thanks to a single area that looked inconspicuous but actually held the answer for why I was stuck. So if you end up playing this mod, keep an eye out for the hooks on this wall here. I kinda wish there would've been more mod for me to play here because I really enjoyed the direction this thing is going in. Just classic survival horror gameplay taking place in a part of the RE timeline that could sorely use a few what-if scenarios. Oh, and massive pluses for the original FMVs and voice dialogue that was created just for this mod. Very cool stuff you don't see very often. Well, I'm afraid I won't be staying. We have a situation. I need access to the facility. Visually, I'd say it's about on par with what I'd expect. They're just reusing Parasite Eve 2's dry field location, but they've done some editing and it's enough to be convincing. There are some totally original sections, or at least ones that look original to me, but for the most part, it's just PE2's backgrounds altered to an actually impressive degree. There might be maybe an hour or two of gameplay in this mod, but it was enough to let me know this team definitely knows how an RE game works. My only criticism would be the two handguns you get sounding exactly the same, and a few occasions where I wasn't able to intuitively follow the puzzle logic. Other than that though, this was a really impressive showcase. Team Revisited obviously understands the little parts necessary to get a proper RE game up and running, and I really hope we get to see this thing finished. Night of the Living Dead on Raccoon Public Access. Johnny! You're still afraid. Stop it now, I mean it. Resident Evil 2 had one hell of an interesting development period. Headed up by Hideki Kamiya, the whole RE2 project basically happened twice. After getting to a nearly complete stage in the process, the general idea was that it didn't stand out from its predecessor enough. That initial build of the game would earn the moniker 1.5 and it kind of sort of means a lot to me. Around the time the RE1 remake was announced, I had semi-regular access to the internet at my house, so I started looking for info on my very favorite game at the time, RE2, and my travels eventually led me to Bioflames, basically your one-stop shop for info on RE1.5. I spent who knows how many hours looking at blurry pictures of RE2 footage running at trade shows or downloading short 15-second QuickTime videos. I became obsessed with what could have been. The different look and feel of the RPD from the finished version to this one, the extra gameplay features that were left on the cutting room floor, it was this really cool mystery and I couldn't help but fall head first into it. Well, flash forward an uncomfortable number of years and a build of 1.5 is leaked to the internet. It isn't the rumored nearly finished version, but hackers would immediately begin trying to stitch it together and as I speak these words, that process is still actively underway. Now there are a few different schools of thought on how to best proceed with that, but what we're looking at here is the MZD or Magic Zombie Door release of the game. This project uses RE2 and its assets to fill in any missing material along with a combination of original 1.5 backgrounds and newly created ones. Essentially, this release aims to make 1.5 play out like an actual video game to whatever degree that's even possible. 
it's stitched together using interpretations of early story drafts, event storyboards, and concept art mixed together with RE Superfan's best guesses and a few shots in the dark. And it's genuinely kind of amazing seeing all this stuff work together. Even though I played through 1.5 a few times by now, it still hits me in some kind of a weird way being able to walk around in this cold blue tinted reception area, a location I had only ever seen in heavily compressed online videos and screenshots. It's truly akin to a religious experience if you grew up with this series, and the absolute best part is this specific release of MCD 1.5 has an arc that's playable on real hardware, so all the footage you've been looking at this whole time came from a real PS1 playing a game that you, I, or anyone else never thought it'd be able to. Now I should mention the PC build currently allows you to explore way more areas than this, but once again you simply cannot expect for me to choose that over being able to see this thing pumping out of my own actual PS1. Starting a new game of 1.5 will have you choosing between Leon who starts on the roof of the RPD and Elza who starts out in the reception area. Accurate to what we know about the original story, these two campaigns don't exactly have a lot of overlap. They both just sort of exist individually. One thing that really surprised me early on are the new FMVs the team made for this project, and on top of that, story sequences now trigger like they would in a real RE game, bringing this thing much closer to feeling like a true finished Resident Evil title. The in-engine stuff is still missing some animations and sound effects, but coming from the last build of the game, this is really showing a lot of progress. There are some features you can't use in this build, like save points and item storage, but it looks like the groundwork has certainly been laid for that to change soon. In Leon's campaign, I wasn't able to get the fire extinguisher to work to move this story scene forward, but I'm pretty sure it works in the PC version because I've seen other people do it before. For some reason, the inventory screen flashes at the top when it's open, but that doesn't really bother me because I'm using a real PS1 controller to combine handgun ammo in an inventory I've only ever seen pictures of. Yeah, I'm going to be using this excuse a lot moving forward. If you get yourself into a bit of a jam, or you just want to see a little more than what's technically accessible to you at the moment, you can use the debug menu to move between different areas and spawn items into your inventory, something you're probably going to want to take advantage of because for some reason the zombies here take a serious beating before going down for good. I would spend upwards of 17 rounds per zombie in this thing, which isn't so bad, but these things are fast as hell and spacing becomes a real issue when it takes so damn long to kill them. I'm really not sure why this is the case here on PS1, but I played it on PC and I don't remember that being an issue then. On the plus side though, shotgun blast to the head worked just fine. Using Elza, you can make your way to the sewer normally without needing the debug menu, but there are a few puzzles you're probably going to want to look up. They do have notes scattered around for some of these, but I wasn't able to find anything in the game that told me how to get this power generator up and running. More than ever though, 1.5 is starting to take the form of a finished product. It's still not there, I mean not by a country mile, but we are seeing improvements made and milestones met, so I really couldn't be more excited for this. When I covered this same MCD project for the first time here in the RE retrospective, I was playing through actual concept images scanned into the game and given boundaries just to pad out locations. But now we have brand new renders inspired by that initial concept art and made in a way that makes it really damn hard to tell what's late 90s CG and what's modern. And smaller systems are working too. You can combine the chemicals that could be found now, damage shows on your character model, and keypads have cool little interfaces. It might be kind of hard to see in the grand scheme of things how much has been improved, but miles of territory has been gained from what I can tell. This lost build of RE2, researching it and learning about it like some kind of early 2000s digital archaeologist, it's a moment in time that I'll always remember, and I don't think I'll ever get over getting to see the zombies pour out of this hallway after the shutter goes up, just like they did in that short teaser reel released by Capcom to press outlets. If you were even remotely interested in this whole scandal or just the entire existence of unfinished game projects, a playthrough 1.5 is an absolute requirement. If you've got an ODE or a mod chip, I'd say real hardware is the most novel option, but even I can admit the more user-friendly option is via PS1 emulation. Regardless of how you do it though, just make sure that you do. RE 1.5 is one of the most captivating entries in the annals of gaming history, and being able to see it up and relatively working, it's something you don't want to miss out on.
Resident Evil Containment is a full conversion mod for the PC port of RE1. Made by familiar face Aiden Watkins, this mod tells the story of Ghost, a USS officer on a mission with Hunk to retrieve research data from the Spencer Mansion that was supposed to be backed up off-site. It seems like Umbrella is perfectly aware of the outbreak going on there, and their worried blast in the place might mean they'd lose all the data gathered, so a team's been put together to grab the goods, but once they make it inside, Hunk gets orders to eliminate his partner. It looks like they suspect him of being an informant because of his eagerness to go on this mission, but when the two talk it out, it turns out Ghost's sister actually just works at the facility, so he was trying to see if she was okay. This mod has you working your way backwards, trying to make it back into the mansion, and it's not exactly one of those could-be-canon type of mods, but it is a fun enough little story. This mod's gameplay is about what you would expect for something taking place inside of Resident Evil 1. Exploration is a little more linear than the base RE1, but items have been moved around and door locks have been changed to shake things up for you. What really impressed me though was the balance of this mod. For the three episodes that I played, my resources were always technically available, but never quite plentiful. I was always able to scrounge up a few bullets or a green herb when I needed one, but I was never in any danger of being overstocked on that stuff. You know, one of the core elements of this genre is controlling resources in order to keep the players stressed out, and I would say containment could teach a class in that subject. It was also really cool seeing Crimson Heads running around in a PS1 RE game, although it seems like they just attached the dog's animations and AI to them. And that's not the end of the list either. Lisa Trevor also shows up, and who knows what else can be found in the last episode because I didn't really get around to playing it. Backgrounds are the same RE1 pre-renders that you're going to be used to, but a lot of them have been changed a bit to further alter things. Now you might argue these changes are a little too gory, but if we're going off of RE1 concept images, this actually kind of tracks well. One of the best edits in my opinion is the mansion in episode 2. The power's out and the only sources of light leak out from under doorways or radiate from bright green glow sticks. It's a whole ass mood and that's helped along greatly by a really well made soundtrack. For whatever reason, one thing I always look for in mods like this are better sound effects. I mean, don't get me wrong, RE1 is an incredible game, but the sound of firing the Beretta leaves a lot to be desired. And on the plus side, containment does include all new sound effects, and I really do appreciate that. I'll admit, this is not the most brand new experience kind of mod you could play. I mean, you're basically just getting RE1 but different, and I'm okay with that. If you're like me, you've played through all the derivatives, all the games inspired by RE, and now you just want to play a classic entry in the series, but you want a slight twist on it. Well, that's exactly what we're looking at right here, and that's good because I really like this one. It didn't have any significant puzzles for the three episodes that I played, but in terms of exploration and combat, this is a true blue RE game. Let's say it's a solid 7 out of 10. Mortal Knight is a mod created by Res Evil Nemesis 30, and it's got an entire new story that doesn't seem to be all too bothered by canon RE narrative. It has to do with a second USS team getting sent into Raccoon City because the G-Virus sample that Hunk retrieved was contaminated. And now the goal is to snatch Sherry Birkin because somehow Umbrella knows that she was infected. Somewhere along the way, Hunk runs into Alyssa from Outbreak and they make a deal to help each other out, all on top of some kind of rivalry Hunk has with another USS member. I don't really know if this is some book universe stuff or just something the modder came up with, but in terms of an excuse to stay in Raccoon City, I'd say it gets the job done pretty okay. It's not masterfully written or even remotely concerned with staying within RE canon, but it's fun enough. I mean, if standard Resident Evil storytelling is our point of comparison, this isn't too far off base. As far as gameplay goes, this mod is actually really unique. There's the expected gunning down of zombies and conserving limited resources, but you can also loot resources from those same gunned down zombies. It's not going to be all of them, and to be honest, the rewards are a bit paltry, but it's a fun new mechanic to mess around with for sure. You'll also come across some areas where a corpse might have something that you need to move forward, so they do a good enough job of making you engage with this at least a little bit. The layout of the game is actually sort of nonsensical. In a few minutes of exploration, you might see screens from Ares 1, 2, and 3, so you can't exactly count on your memory to get around. 
Most of the RPD seems similar to how you might remember it, but even there you're not exactly safe. The developers gone in and added doors where there weren't any before, and that's on top of items, door locks, and events being rearranged. There also seems to be an element of randomness added in here. I restarted episode 1 after I got an idea of how to better play the game, and I noticed different enemies placed in different areas. It seems like key items are pretty consistent, but ammo and health pickups can vary. The modder added in all new secret item locations, and these also seem to bend to the whims of RNG. Oh, and there's new super zombies. They have the same familiar RE3 style zombie model, but their undead asses can get up and sprint at you at mock speed. You know, I really can't put my finger on it, but seeing these grotesque zombie models up and running at full speed just really creeps me out for some reason. Sometimes I could get them to glitch up and run away from me, either that or the modder programmed in some kind of baiting AI because they also had a tendency to lunge at me when I try to take advantage of that glitch. Mortal Knight has several episodes available, but I only played through the prologue in episode 1, and I've gotta say, if the others are as long as the first one, this mod's gonna have some length to it. Part of me thinks it'd be impossible to keep the RPD as an interesting location for that long, but since this mod isn't trying to keep any kind of location-based continuity, the sky's the limit. The soundtrack seems to mostly be remixes or homages to classic RE tracks, but they used at least one song from a favorite artist of mine, Survival Spheres, here on YouTube. There are dialogue options in the mod, and I'm not exactly sure how much they alter the story, but I kept picking the non-evil option, and Hunk was turning into a bit of a dork. When I pick this thing back up, I think I'm gonna go all in on an Umbrella Hitman persona instead. Overall, I'll say this mod was pretty cool. The unique mechanics here feel like pretty wild departures, but they also kind of work really well. Having to kill a specific zombie and then run their pockets to find info or key items needed to proceed just feels like a direction RE may have evolved in had the classic style of games been allowed to continue. You will find a bit of jankiness here, but it's also got a brand new OST, new cutscenes, arranged gameplay, all new mechanics, and a new story. Not exactly bad for a 100% free mod. And bringing it right back around to mods you can play on actual consoles, we have the RE0 Demake. This is a full conversion mod of RE2 that isn't necessarily trying to recreate RE0's original N64 build, but instead wants to reimagine the game as if it had come out on the PS1. And it actually works really well. Because RE0 already stuck so close to the tenets of survival horror, it feels right seeing it look closer to RE1 than RE1 Remake. The backgrounds seem to come straight from RE0 on the GameCube, and surprisingly, the same goes for the FMVs. So, you seem to know me. Been fantasizing about me, have you? Sure, these things have the familiar PS1 compression artifacts, but I don't know, they look pretty good, all things considered. I will say the execution isn't exactly perfect, though. There's one FMV that skips, almost like my console's having trouble keeping up with it, and the one that plays when you meet Billy just sort of plays over the background music that was already going. Still though, this is really awesome to see, and the fact that it's playing on an actual PS1 just makes it all the more sweeter. And speaking of playing, expect this thing to feel like RE2 for obvious reasons, and again for obvious reasons, that's a very good thing. The partner swapping mechanic is alive and well in this mod, and while there is a bit of a pause when you use it, it's amazing seeing it work on a PS1. I'm not really sure if this is the case on PC, but here on PS1, the entire train section is playable basically in its entirety, and it's really impressive. Of course, you are going to find the telltale signs of an RE mod, though. Stuff like new enemies obviously just being reskins of existing RE2 bad guys, including AI, or the rampant 3D models showing over top of foreground assets. All stuff I am perfectly willing to put up with just to be able to play such a cool project. I always see some kind of mock-up sprite art for a demake or maybe a GIF concept on Twitter, but rarely does it lead to anything this substantial. This clearly took a lot of work, and a good percentage of it probably went towards being able to spin it up on an actual PS1. 
I would love to see this project expand to include the full game, although I imagine that would be supremely difficult, if not impossible to do while keeping it playable on real hardware. Regardless though, if you get a chance, you should really give this demake a shot. It really does a lot to conceptualize just how true Zero stayed to its genre, so much so that you can almost perfectly transplant it into a retro console like the PS1 and just about everything plays and feels exactly like it did on the GameCube. This being a fan project developed by people who are probably never going to see financial gain for their work, I don't exactly expect it to go much further than it already has, but I suspect if anything's going to change that, a big increase in the amount of people playing it might, so maybe go out there and do something good for the world. Billy. What? Be careful. Yeah. The RE Upscale project is relatively easy to sum up and much easier to sell. When Capcom released their relatively lazy remaster of the classic RE1 remake, it was universally panned for its poorly upscaled 2D backgrounds. I'm not exaggerating when I say nearly every screen suffered from some kind of major visual flaw, and for a lot of us it was genuinely distracting. I'm sure most of you have already put this together already, but the RE Upscale project is a mod that replaces those nasty looking pre-renders with ones that were run through modern AI upscaling apps and that were manually touched up by people who really wanted them to look their best. Looking at the original and modded images side by side shows a massive improvement, almost to the point where I'd say this should be bundled with the game download when you purchase it through Steam. I did talk about this one much more in depth in my recent video covering all of RE1R's ports if you want to check that out, but the long and short of it is this mod is all upsides. Other than this thing having a relatively hefty file size to it, there's really no negatives I could hit it with, so if you are looking to replay RE1 Remaster on PC, you need to also have a download of the RE Upscale project going simultaneously. It's a huge improvement over what you'd normally get out of the base game, and just like every other mod on this list, it's free, so you might as well try it out. Calm Before the Storm is a prologue chapter set up to demo the upcoming During the Storm full conversion mod, and I've gotta say it did not take very long for this game to intrigue me. The story sees you taking control of Kevin from Outbreak as he deals with everyday life before and during the Raccoon City G-Virus outbreak. The former giving you a chance to run around the streets of the city and get an idea of what they look like when they're filled with regular people going about their business as opposed to their default state, being trampled by hordes of the undead. This is one thing I always thought the classic RE games were missing. Showing us how things worked here before everything went to shit really goes a long way to scale the threat up. We saw what the world looked like when it was functioning as intended and now we can really appreciate all the carnage and chaos happening to it. This mod really seems to focus on story more than anything we've looked at so far. There's a lot of dialogue in this thing and not all of it is necessary for you to actually see. You can just walk around and talk to people and there are decisions you can make in conversations that might change things. There's a whole lot here in terms of narrative and that's got me really hopeful for the finished release of During the Storm. In the few sections of the demo where you can get an idea of how the combat feels, I've gotta say I really like what I'm seeing. The mod was thrown a lot at me, but it was a really satisfying challenge. When first defending the RPD, I kept running out of ammo until I realized I could loot the corpses of my fellow officers, introducing a mechanic I already really got into in Mortal Night. I'm not really sure who was working on it first, but I just want to say I'm a really big fan of it being included in both mods. Shooting feels great, and the gun I was given by Roy from 1.5 has a really high chance of criticals. I doubt it's going to have a negative effect on the survival horror balance of the mod, but I can guarantee you it has a positive effect on how fun combat feels. Throughout the demo, the one area where I can say it objectively started to struggle was in the audio. The songs weren't made to be looped, so they started and stopped abruptly, and the sound effects are mixed way higher than everything else. Regardless of that though, I am very interested in this mod. The story seems more than fun, and the developers are willing to put a lot of effort into telling it. And I think that's a word that perfectly describes this entire mod. Effort. 
everything in here seems to take a lot of effort and a lot of know-how to get working. I mean, a big open scene with lots of characters on screen that you can talk to may not seem impressive in a general game design sense, but in a this is happening inside of RE2 sense, it is absolutely incredible. So I guess it goes without saying, I will absolutely be keeping an eye out for during this storm. This demo showed a whole lot of promise despite being relatively short, which I think reminds me a lot of myself. Resident Evil 3 Lord of Necropolis is one hell of a mod. It's not quite a full conversion because there's so much of vanilla RE3 here, but it's also about as far as it can be from that release. Aside from a few cosmetic changes like Nemesis having an edgy ass hood and Jill using her RE3R look, there's almost too many changes here to list. You can now dodge with a press of a button combo without needing an attack to be incoming, which is a neat little mechanic that can be fun as hell to mess with. It feels sort of like Jill runs a little faster, but if she doesn't, I can guarantee you Nemesis and some of the zombies absolutely do. Just about every item in the game is in a different spot and parts of the map have been blocked off, making this a decidedly more narrow affair than OGRE3. You now have to craft ink ribbons using first aid sprays, which is a very cool trade-off, and all new environmental hazards have been added like breakable statues, bags of flour, and the kind of electrical generators you could find in 3 Remake. Getting this mod working was a bit of an affair though. You'll need a fresh install of RE3 Source next, which is no big deal, but in its base form, I had all kinds of issues. For whatever reason, the in-game resolution would only go up to 1600 by 1200 even after I changed it in the INI file, and my controller would only register the analog stick, not the D-pad. But worst of all, it was a decision between either nasty bilinear filtered textures and morphing polygons, or good looking sharp textures and the kind of seams that mods like Classic Rebirth and Seamless HD look to eliminate. And since we're on that subject, checking out the mod DB page for Lord of Necropolis, its creator says they're not sure if it works with Classic Rebirth, but you knew damn well I was going to try it. And after playing a good bit of it with CR, I can say it doesn't seem to affect anything major in any significant way. Really, the only issue I was able to find is that the start screen when using Classic Rebirth will display OGRE3's Arrange option instead of LON's Overhaul mode which isn't the worst problem to have, especially since it means much better scaling, a super sample option that gets rid of those seams, perfect controller support, and the ability to skip door animations. Oh, and regardless of whether or not you're using Classic Rebirth, if you try to start a normal new game of RE3 using Lord of Necropolis, it results in something that could either be a purposefully hilarious event or an accidentally funny bug, but either way, I absolutely love it. Getting into the overhaul mode, I want to say right up front, this is one hell of a difficult mod. The very first section of it, in my opinion, acts as a way more aggressive filter than the start of RE2. As soon as you're able to get control of your character, you have this huge crowd of zombies coming up on you from one side, and on the other you have a slightly less dense crowd. After maybe two failed attempts, I was able to figure out a nice general path to follow, but even after I knew that, all it would take is a microsecond of turning too late and I would essentially get bite locked into a game over screen. Moving forward, there's something that should perfectly illustrate my earlier point. This mod is so wildly known for being difficult that its developer decided to add in a toggle for easy mode by having players pray to the statue at the start, and I have no issues telling you that on my third death, I happily activated that mode which in full disclosure did absolutely nothing to keep me from racking up an additional 5 deaths. Even after using a pretty significant leg up on the game, I still found it to be just excruciatingly hard. On normal mode, I had to cheese out kills with a little trick that has knife strikes resetting way faster after you hit a wall to make up for the massive length of time in between me finding the pistol and me finding any ammo for it. Nemesis in this mod is somehow even more of a cockroach than he was before. 
He moves insanely fast and will follow you into areas that he used to keep out of, including save rooms. On top of that, being able to navigate Three's map by memory actually acted against me. I kept trying to run away from him, only to hit one of the new roadblocks. I did eventually try taking him down when I got my hands on a shotgun, but even on easy mode and me really trying to abuse that dodge mechanic, he beat my ass. In his defense though, it wasn't just him. Just about every single monster included in this mod absolutely had their way with me. Just the sheer amount of enemies you'll encounter on every screen is mind-boggling if you're used to traditional RE. Fun fact, when I triggered this scene right here, I had exactly one knife, one handgun, and 15 rounds of ammo for that handgun in my inventory. So yeah, suffice it to say, this as a mod is an absolute ass-blasting difficulty-wise. Like I said, even after I switched it to easy mode, this thing was slapping me around to an embarrassing degree, which actually sucks. There's a lot of new stuff in this mod, and because of the difficulty, I just flat out will not get to see it. Now I will say this, I would sit down with this mod and die an insane amount of times then put it down in frustration but not even 30 minutes later I was itching to take another shot at it and while I would get further on the new attempt I did eventually get bodied again. It seems like the kind of game you're going to want to bash your head against for a good chunk of time until you perfect the optimal route and come back with a lot of luck and tank control mastery. Now I'm not going to say this is the Dark Souls of RE mods because that's such an infantile way of looking at video games, but after I did mention it, you are going to be thinking it, which is basically the same idea. Really and truly, I could feel myself getting more and more used to LON on each run, but sadly I do only have so much time to produce these videos, so I really doubt I'll be seeing its end by the time you guys are watching this, but I don't want that to sound like an insult. I mean, it's an understatement to say this mod's gonna challenge you, to the point where it's probably better to say it'll humble you. It does give you a whole gang of new tools to engage with, but I'd say even with the advantages you're handed, it's not a matter of if you'll die on a run, but when. And while that may sound like harsh criticism, and for some of you it will be, I get the feeling this is exactly what the mods developers were going for. Like, yeah, maybe it's going to kick your teeth in, but there is a very specific subset of RE fan that will say they didn't really need those teeth anyways. Plus, and I cannot understate this, it is so damn fun dodge rolling out of a zombie grab with not even a single frame to spare, then drawing your gun and getting a head pop. It's incredible. <laughs> I really wish there was a version of Lord of Necropolis that didn't come with ball torturing mechanics so I could get more opportunities to mess around with all the new additions. If all the chaos on screen for this section has sort of soured you on this mod, I do get it. Even with my crazy ass taste, this thing is sitting near the very boundary of what I'm okay with, but if any of this even remotely made you pay attention or crack a smile, I do recommend checking it out. It's certainly not going to be for everyone, but if you've got a mean streak in you, this may be exactly what you're looking for, and I can confirm this mod has a sort of magnetic energy making you want just one more attempt after you've died. So definitely give this one a shot, but you know, maybe move any fragile objects away from arm's reach until you've gotten acclimated to it. Resident Evil Ultimate Director's Cut is a patch made to re-uncensor the Director's Cut release of RE1 on the PlayStation 1. If you didn't know, this version's entire reason for existing is the fact that it included the FMVs from the Japanese version, the fully colorized and uncensored ones. It even touted this as a major feature on the box art, only when it came time to press the game to disc, there was some kind of a mix-up and the regular old censored US cutscenes were included instead. So this patch merely exists to swap in the intended content. It also replaces a few backdrops for ones that were found in the demo release of the game, but really that's about it, at least for the base game. On top of being able to play Resident Evil Director's Cut on a real PS1 with the intended uncensored FMVs, you also get a deranged mode, and in my opinion, it's actually the best reason to try this thing out. I mean listen, those original FMVs were creepy as hell and the addition of color and gore to them really did improve that effect, but you could just watch those cutscenes on YouTube. 
In fact, you've been able to do that in some kind of form since the actual director's cut released. So when it's time to talk someone into playing this mod, I would say the Dearranged mode offers a much more attractive sales pitch. It totally flips item placement and enemies as well, which is always great to see, but it also teleports you around to a degree that I assume is random. There's also some new additions to this mode in the form of little homages and easter eggs. It's really fun actually, and the only criticism I might have would be the insane nature of the arranged mode making the difficulty way steeper than it ever was in the original. But then again, if you are looking to play an arranged mode in a Resident Evil game, something tells me that's exactly what you'd be looking for anyways. This mod may not be the most world-shattering in terms of new content, but it basically fixes Capcom's mistakes from the 90s and adds a really cool arranged mode as a consolation prize. And you get yet another thumbs up from me for a patch that could be played on real hardware. So if you're somehow bored of RE1 but you also want to play it again, I would say this is the perfect, doesn't change very much, but makes it different enough for you to justify playing through the game again kind of mod. Please, escape. But don't you worry, girly. You'll be safe in here. Alright, so real quick before we start here, a lot of this mod's appeal is centered around it surprising you, and watching this section is probably going to take away from how much fun you could have with it. So if you are planning on playing Kendo's Cut, I would say just skip this section altogether. I fully recommend you guys checking it out, and I want to show you all of its ridiculousness, but I would much rather you see it for yourself. And moving on with the rest of you that are left, it was actually this mod that sort of drove me to make this video in the first place. I saw Bokba Soup streaming it, and after a few minutes I had to stop watching because I knew this was something I wanted to see for myself. So I downloaded and installed it, and at first I didn't even know I was playing a mod. The intro is exactly the same, and nothing happens any differently on the streets of Raccoon City. Right up until you get inside Kendo's shop, you could be forgiven for thinking you had somehow messed up the mod's installation because that's exactly what I thought. But then this happens. Wait. And from here on out, things are going to get progressively stranger until it hits some kind of a quirkiness singularity. The general idea is that Kendo survives his encounter at the start of the G-Virus outbreak and is present for all the events of RE2, and as if being fueled by his status as an RE meme, the guy's nearly an unstoppable killing machine. At first, his sightings are hilarious but relatively tame, but as you keep playing the game, things start to rapidly devolve into side-splitting chaos, and interestingly, you can say the same thing for the gameplay. The RPD is almost exactly how you remember it, minus a few alterations made to facilitate a gag or two, but when you make it into the Umbrella Lab under Raccoon City, things take a very, very weird turn. This is my husband's legacy. I ain't got no clue, darling. You know, it's kind of hard to explain this one, because on one end, it's essentially the video game equivalent of a shitpost, but on the other, it's actually really well made and it's funny, which is probably the most important aspect. Very, very good stuff. Like I said at the start, it's a full recommendation. It's ridiculous and dumb in all the best ways. 10 out of 10 for the RPD COD piece. If there was a single game in the Resident Evil franchise that deserved way more goodwill, it would be RE Survivor, but if there was a good game in the series that gets less love than it deserves, it's Zero. Now I'll be the first to admit, it can be a very challenging game and the lack of a storage system only adds to that, but in my opinion, this is an amazing way of cranking up difficulty in a genre appropriate way. Instead of throwing more threats at the player or increasing HP values, you make them think more deeply about strategy. Before you set off in RE0, you've got to make sure Billy and Rebecca's inventories are nice and minimalist looking, and in the inevitable event that you fill up all open item slots, you've got to engage in some really extensive item swapping. 
and that's to say nothing of the damn near revolutionary mechanic of being able to drop items on the ground and come back and pick them up anytime you want. This has always been really fun for me, but the majority opinion seems to be that this is one of the more negative aspects of Zero's gameplay. So with that in mind, we've got the RE0 item box mod, and it does what you think it does gives you access to a traditional Resident Evil style item storage box. They didn't physically add any of these boxes into the game, but instead they made them an option when examining a typewriter, and they work exactly like they did in any other Resident Evil game. Like you would expect, you can access items no matter where you are, which is admittedly more convenient than the base game. I will admit this does mess with the game's intended difficulty and mechanics, but on the plus side, when you get all the way to the church and realize you need the grappling hook, you don't need to turn around and walk the distance of an entire continent to go back and get it. One thing to be careful of though, when you're using the item box, if you switch to your partner's inventory, you're going to want to make sure that they're close enough to you to interact with a typewriter or the exchange option won't appear. And you know, it may have only been a few seconds since I said this mod sort of messes with the game's original difficulty, but I'm starting to think that that may not be the case. I mean, yes, it is obviously more convenient to haul all your items around with you, confident in the knowledge that you could drop them off in a box and still have access to them anywhere. But to temper that, this mod also disables the option to drop items on the ground, meaning you now have to deal with an incredibly small inventory made that way to account for the aforementioned ability. I mean, now that item storage is my only option, I ran into several situations where it would have been very nice to just drop a red herb so I could grab an important item instead of having to visit the nearest typewriter to do it. So I would say things aren't more or less difficult using this mod, but instead just sort of difficult in a different way. I mean, it definitely changes the way that I approach playing this game, but it does so in a way that doesn't necessarily mess with that overall Resident Evil Zero feeling. Now I want to make this crystal clear, I am still and always will be a vocal supporter of the original inventory system of this game, but I can also admit this mod is a really great option to have for people that are less correct than I am. I could shoot, you know. Well guys, that's about it for me, and I hope you enjoyed yourselves here. I've been getting asked about covering RE mods for as long as I can remember, and I'm glad I finally listened. As it turns out, I was missing out on some seriously cool stuff. And I think that goes a long way in showing how dedicated and passionate a fan base the Resident Evil franchise has. I mean, most of the mods I covered here were made in the last five or so years. And that means, even now, there are people so enamored with old RE games that they're teaching themselves game development skills just so they could play a few more of them. That's kind of inspiring when you think about it. If you guys get the urge to try any of these out, I'll have the appropriate links in the description, and if you end up really enjoying a mod, try to track down the people that made it and tell them how much you liked it. It's a really sad fact, but modding video games, even with an incredible degree of skill, is a relatively thankless job, but maybe we could change that. Oh, and if you guys can think of any really good mods that I missed, let me know in the comments. It would be really killer to be able to make another one of these videos. But until that happens, thank you all so much for watching the Resident Evil Retrospective. Hey, 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 thank you all very much for coming to hang out. As usual, we've got links for support platforms like Patreon in the description and on screen. And if you're not in a lucky enough position to be able to support internet videos, I would say making it to this point is a strong enough compromise. That being the case, maybe think about clicking that like button, sharing the video around, or subscribing. Or maybe consider continuing to be a little cutie because that's exactly what you are. Alright, peace out, I love you all, go listen to death metal and play video games.